thank you so much, Olaf. We for sure should do a follow up of the book in 10 years. And I asked my colleague Ari Lindemann in Kuman, like so, but it could be nice, would it be okay for him to go to Lacht instead and change? I'm sure he said, would say yes. Uh, thanks for inviting me. As a Norwegian, we always have looked very much up to the Finns. I grew up in the late 60s and then we heard it was the Finns who invented the idea, had the Swedes to produce it and had the Danes to sell it to a Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also very honoured to come after you, to speak after you. Here we are in Lahti and I grew up with ski jumping. <laughs> My father would have smiled in his grave if he knew I was here. You know, it was the big thing to see in front of the television. And we had a saying in Norway. We had a good ski jumper. He was not the high Finnish caliber like yours. He, his name was Virkola. Mm -hmm. And in Norway we say, if you are a little afraid, if you come after a big guy, it's kind of like jumping after Virkola. <laughs> so, Alan, I'm jumping after you now. <laughs> well, it's uh, not easy to give a presentation of something that has taken three years to perform. <laughs> this is actually a book. It's a joint book. It's an edited book. My co-editor is David Gibson from University of Texas at Austin. And we were so lucky to have international collaborators in UK, in US, in Finland, in Sweden and Norway. And I do hope that we could take something managerial take away from this. And this is also my hope when I've been invited here today and for our future communication. To take away the managerial takeaway for something that is published. The background is, as you already indicated, we have had a lot of global recessions, structural economic shifts. You have seen that, we have discussed that today, and you told me how actually it all started when uh, uh, Soviet kind of collapsed and a lot of different uh, political issues so happened so that actually a lot of the Finnish uh, production needed to change many, many years ago. Uh, now, of course, after the, <coughs> the crisis in, in America, who actually also affected Europe so severe, we have almost no country that's not has had a structural economic shift and uh, uh, depression. So what actually do governments then do? They look to the universities and ask the universities to help them. Universities have always been funded publicly and now they say, you guys, you guys have to help us. You have to be regional motors in your regions. You have to contribute to our competitiveness. And how shall actually universities respond? So in that sense, the universities are actually challenged. You know, we always say that the first mission is education, our second is research, and now the third one is actually innovation and economic development. The two first missions we have known for all the years, we know how to do that, we know how to teach, and we do know to research. But how to combine these two and actually to be motors or engine for our communities? So that is actually not obvious how to institutionalize this compared to the other missions. That is actually a, a quite severe background that is a little bit more complicated. We call that the entrepreneurial turn. It is actually a turn that the universities have to respond to. And that is an institutional change. This is a research-based book. So we needed a kind of framework 
and we use the institutional theory change work from Dick Scott at Stanford University, Mo maybe the most influential person actually in institutional theory and organization theory. And what is actually what is actually institutional change? It's actually a change, an institution perform actually conventions for how, how we shall uh, uh, expect it to perform. That is what everybody is expecting of a, a university. So what we then do is to try to commercialize research, we license our technology, creating university spin-offs, expanding university industrial relations. That is actually what we try now to do in order to meet the demands. So the research questions in the book is actually what actors and forces are important in motivating institutional change and developing the university's entrepreneurial architecture. That is our first research questions. And our second is how do universities interact with institutional context and developing entrepreneurially. So again, universities are constrained and shaped and penetrated within a wider environment, and that is actually affecting them. The entrepreneurial architecture, why do I mention this? The entrepreneurial architecture is actually a set of dimensions that is developed by Tim Worley from Sheffield University. He's a very bright chap. He was first at Oxford, then Cambridge, and then moved to, to Sheffield. This, let us see it a little bit like this. The structures, what is that? That is actually technology transfer offices, incubators, technology parks and business portals. It's actually everything that you have told us about today, Ulla and Alti and Sari, you know, the, everything that you kind of build up at, uh, at, uh, <coughs> at your university. That is the kind of structures that is going to lead to action. The systems, that is actually, you can call it networks, the system of communication that focuses between make the structures work and make the administration work. Leadership. Think about the big leaders you have had in the Finnish history. <laughs> you have a lot of them. The emphasis is the qualification and orientation of all the school with key influences. It can be board of directors, it can be department heads, it can be star scientists. The strategies, I had, I got even your strategy today. You know, you guys, you are really here. Like the University of Applied Science Strategy 2000, you already have it. Very nice. <laughs> that is institutional goals elaborated as planning documents and policy. And then the last one that is difficult, that is culture. Refers to institutional, departmental, individual attitudes and norms. So Tim Wallace says, the, in order to develop entrepreneurially, you guys have to develop that in some order or another. This is kind of the institutional kind of take on in how to develop entrepreneurially. So that was what we wanted to explore in the book. So let us go a little bit back to the, to, to the institutional theory. What do we have here? We have three pillars of influences, and that is the regulative, the normative, and the cognitive. What do we have on the top, the regulative? It's a little bit when your government decides that the three universities in Helsinki shall merge. That is a regulative, it's a formal policy, it's on the top, it's decided, and that is going to drizzle down and then form a behavior and structure at the lower level. What is a normative pillar? That is actually formal and informal rules within the individual universities and subsets of colleges and departments. That means at your university, there are some departments, they are not very keen on commercialization. You know, why should they be? They, they are maybe an art department. So there are different units within a university that maybe have very, very different attitude towards how they should be a motor and engine in the environment. 
And then the cognitive. Motives, beliefs, concepts and perception of individual faculty. Think about <laughs> in your own organization. Aren't we very different in how we think that our, our organization shall improve? Not, everyone, not everything is like. So there are these things here. If you go from the top, that is kind of top-down influences. That happens when the government decides and the university perform. But we also are, have the bottom-up. What happened when we are bottom-up? In this book, if you read the Alto chapter, you see how <laughs> very much the students geared up with all those initiatives. They actually changed a lot of what is going on in the university because they took action. That is bottom up. Mm. So that is very important, both to understand the top down and the bottom up. And as you said, Alan, it was actually not the government who kind of decided. It was not the region. It was <laughs> spurred from below. So this is two kind of movements that is kind of interesting to explore. How did we do that? David and I, we couldn't go to a lot of different universities in a lot of different countries. What do you do? First of all, you have to understand what is needed in the research. Actually, it's a few attempts to collect and to compare empirical material in different national and regional contexts. Our field lacks this knowledge. We need contrasting examples. Then we also need not only to study MIT, not only to study Cambridge, we need to also study the mediocre universities and the lower level universities. So we chose universities from different nations, all in a civilized society, but which actually had different institutional environment. US, UK, Finland, Sweden, and Norway. Then, who should kind of write these stories? Who should do this? We thought, let us ask key persons within these universities who we do know work with entrepreneurship and innovation, who have been around for a while. We, all, we asked Mats Lundqvist at Chalmers University. He has built up a study program. We asked Ari Lindemann in Cuba, so as he has been around for a while and has known how the battles have, have been. So we asked our colleagues that we knew could tell a story because they knew what was kind of happening. So these stories, these cases are written by participant observers and they also have knowledge and access to data. They had done interviews, archives and documents and they know what happened. That, of course, means that we have some way a narrative. It's a narrative of organizational change. It has a strength of authenticity and plausibility, and it also means if another one had written it, the story could have been different. So that you have to take into account. Here is just the university comparative statistics. Look at this. The number of students, very different, from the universities, Cambridge, Lund, Chalmers, New York, UT Austin, UIT, North in Tromsø, Kingston University, London, Human Laxo, University of Stavanger and Alto. Different number in total students, very different number, some have a large array of faculty and lot of staff, means they are more research based, and some actually have more staff then they have faculty. Research budget, enormous differences in the research budget. Some are more polytechnic and some are really heavy research universities. And then the region, the population they are serving. So see, we do get a lot of variety within the cases that does say that they are operating in different environments and different constraints. We don't have time to go all through that, but I just wanted to show you the map, since we are a, very, a little bit keen on regions. <laughs> Here we are in England, yeah? Cambridge and Kingston, Norway, you know, you still like Norway a little bit, don't you? Although we are very, yeah. You see, we actually like the Finns a 
very much better than the Swedes. <laughs> so it's just that that's just in between us. But uh, really, really, yeah. Here we have the Swedes. They are very clever. Yes, they are. But uh, they are also very proud of it. All this, it's a little bit nagging. Here we have the Finns. I just love Finland. You know, we're always done it, but no, no more and more. Yes. I hope I did, did that correctly here. Yeah. Would be uh, awful to come here and not pick the, the, the right regions. And US. Yeah. <laughs> too small, you know, too universal in a big country. Okay. Uh, the narrative evolution of universities uh, is just uh, we try to kind of, uh, before I show you more the details. Uh, Austin uh, is actually an evolution from a technical to entrepreneurial. And uh, Cambridge, actually from agricultural to technological. Kingston was a polytechnic. Very interesting university to see how a polytechnic had to struggle and to compete against Cambridge. Actually, if you, if you read the book, you can see that we picked a classical university and a new university in each country in order to have the contrast. Lund is an extremely scientific-based university with a long, long traditions, and it was really difficult for them to overcome these academic tensions and to get their hands dirty. Chalmers, fantastic. A very interesting case, but it was actually the industry that asked for that, not themselves. You know, it's very interesting to read the cases and see, as you said, it's not always the university that takes the action, it's actually the industry. Alto is the most interesting example to show how this entrepreneurial ecosystem it very, very much was helped by the student. And Kuhlman Lakso, uh, if you read that chapter, it's so interesting to see uh, Ari Lindemann has so much, very good, told the story of the difficulties in the transition when his region was actually uh, hard hit. So from skilled labor to entrepreneurial talent. And Tromsø, <laughs> I really come from a very north area where actually we had the strategy for the third mission already when it opened in 68, because the first president said that the curriculum shall not only be for the university, it shall serve the people. You know, my university was actually established because there were no doctors <coughs> up there. And you know, the doctors, they are so rigid, they need to be in a father house. It should always be in Oslo. And they said, is it actually possible? Are somebody sick up there? <laughs> you know, and then, then very much it was put forward that the medicine education should start in Tromsø. And interestingly, when you think about the entrepreneurial system, the thing is that the medicine education in my university has been innovative from day one, because you know what, what they said? They said that we are not going to have the students be taught it in medicine without seeing a patient until this year sixth. So at University of Tromsø, they see the patient actually after a couple of years. So we have a quite different learning mode that we created that time. That is a sign when you leave the father house and you can start. And that was good to start remote. At that time, I'm sure the flight was, you know, four hours or something. So no, they never checked upon us when, from us. But you see what I mean? If, if you start later than the other, you also have the legitimacy to do it your, your own way. Because the big one, they are actually busy with themselves. Stavanger, very interesting. That is actually the capital, the oil capital of Norway. We learned them from the, from the people in Texas. <laughs> so then we, they went from petroleum to entrepreneurship. There the industry again fight for, for having a university. They are still having a little bit of difficulty with their academic uh, uh, level, but uh, it's very, very uh, prospering university. And then New York University, a, a fabulous case where actually the state and the government and the city works together. Let us see a little bit about the structures. 
actually Cambridge is most uh, successful examples because it shows so very very well all the organizations this all the the the, the efforts to 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 make uh, to make it work uh, then uh, we also have uh, seen that the structures they are not actually independent of the attitudes towards entrepreneurship so the structures that are good are actually in the universities that do it quite well. So also in Alto, we see very well developed structures. We do see a kind of a path dependency. If you have built one kind of structure, then you build another. And you have an example with Austin, they have no science park, but they have other uh, uh, structures that, that work very well. So that is, and that was actually very easy to kind of measure, to, to, to list all the structures, that was not a difficulty for the authors. I then you have... Then, if I might just say one thing. Yeah. The collegiate system in Cambridge helped a lot because the colleges are relatively independent. Yes. And compete with each other. Exactly. So Trinity did the science park, St John's did the innovation centre. Exactly. That, that was independent good. of a university decision. Exactly. So the collegiate system did help a lot. Yeah. <coughs> very, very, very good. When it comes to the network, that was actually very interesting because it was a national law in Sweden that motivated universities to cooperate with surrounding institutions. And that very much had an impact on the development of the, they call it the Lund University Innovation System. Uh, when we go to Kingston, they had actually a West Focus Consortium that was funded as a nationally inspired collaboration. There were quite different universities that collaborated and Martha Mador was really the master woman that kind of kept it together. And these informal networks, Chalmers talk a lot about because they were, they were actually developed much without the effort from the university. So the networks are very, very important. And as uh, Alan says, uh, you know, the colleges, the colleges in Cambridge, I was very lucky myself to get into a college. I had to apply, it, I needed three other professors to write something nice about me, and I went into Clare Hall, finally, very nice. And then you sit at the college dinner. You have a physicist to your right, <laughs> you have a person who is in English literature to your left. You actually, you have to communicate with all the different disciplines. And that really spurs something. That, that, that is very interesting. When it comes to leadership, you know, you probably know in New York, that was also the governor, Mc, uh, Andrew McCuma, who actually helped a lot. And he was leading the entrepreneurial university by launching the startup New York. He kind of created tax-free zones to attract and grow new businesses across the state. And also the mayor, Michael Bloomberg, em emphasized the importance in all the five bor uh, boroughs on the New York City. So if you want to see a case where both uh, the state <laughs> and the city kind of work together, New York is a very, very good example. They really worked well together. It's also interesting to see the leaders may maybe come from somewhere else. If you look at Austin, George Kosmetsky was actually a Russian guy, and he was actually a successful Californian-based entrepreneur. And he was the appointed the dean of the University's College in Business in 1966. He founded IC Square in innovation capital, where David Gibson works. And it's a lot of knowledge to him that so much is created in Austin. So there is always kind of a leader that has done a significant kind of job. When it comes to the strategy, it's very interesting to see that in Alto case, it was motivated by the desire to align the national social development with the university's mission. So this merge of the three institutions connected public, private and education initiatives. So the strategy of Alto, world's best innovation university, contribute to societal economic development through world class research, 
interdisciplinary collaboration and pioneering education. So the strategies at the universities are also aligned very much with how their government is actually decided how the university shall operate. And we do see that the strategies, you know, not every of the universities is, is very hands-on with it. Many of these are, you know, you write a strategy but you never use it. <laughs> so there's always a lot of work with strategies to operationalize it, to, to make it actually work. And the culture. This was very interesting in Kingston because the student wanted a lot of, univer of, uh, of, univer of um, <coughs> entrepreneurship um, education, but they actually didn't have quite a university culture. And it was actually Alan Gibb who did a really nice, uh, interesting evaluation and who kind of helped them get it, uh, get it right. And the, if you take Austin, you know, it, they have a regional culture, kind of, it's open, you know, although it's Texas. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it, Austin is very, and it's an island in Texas, and something is very, very different from this very uh, conservative uh, Republican elsewhere in, in Texas. They're open, it's tolerant, it's can do, and it's supportive for entrepreneurship. And very, you know, Dell was invented there, Dell and Whole, Whole Foods, a lot of big innovations. And also very interesting, actually, that in some sense, we talk about Silicon Valley, but very many came actually to Austin because the host prices was lower there, and it was easier for, for, for the businesses actually to start up, and also because of the tax, tax uh, system. You know, when we do have these dimensions, it was actually not very easy to see that they were not intertwined. And we actually kind of concluded in this book that you need to have a culture first. You, have, you need to have a culture for entrepreneurship. <coughs> and that will kind of affect the leadership, which again makes the networks, which again makes strategy, and then you end up with good stru stru structures. We thought that this movement was seen to be the most successful. It's not very, it's, it's not that you, you cannot actually just start, if you start with a structure without any culture for it, it will take time in order that it works. But that is not general, you know? We always kind of say, where is the best example? Where is the best practice? We kind of conclude in this book that it is no best practice because each university developed their university entrepreneurially in order aligned with their context. So we kind of see that you have the national and regional context that impacts the entrepreneurial architecture, and then that can also impact the regional and national context. So we have quite, quite complicated relationships here. And there is no model that fits all. That is really the, the conclusion. So the main findings. Change in the entrepreneurial architecture is often motivated by actors or influences, informal or informal leaders, that actually react at the contextual change at a regulative level. So that means that at a regulative level, when changes happen, leaders take action. That was very significant. Sometimes a regional crisis, a poli policy initiative, may be an act of division, important stimuli for change. And that means that the national and regional context, it speeds and impacts and speeds the form of universities' entrepreneurial architecture, or it can delay it. But they can never compete. Kingston could never compete with Cambridge. Cambridge will always receive the much research money, but they have both good missions and should be supported. The universities in emerging regions are very important, like Human Laxo and like University of Tromsø, and the Stimulate Students' Page initiatives 
and include them in developing the entrepreneurial architecture. That is actually a very, very interesting finding that people maybe should think more about. How important the students are for being a vibrant uh, part of the university. Thank you so much. <laughs>